distinguished guest, uh, Professor Carlotta Dritis, who is uh, the main player of the show, uh, Professor Suda, uh, who came all the way from uh, another continent, uh, Professor, uh, the, the, the acting dean, uh, uh, Professor Mutietier. Um, I will also have the Deputy Vice Chancellor from VETS. Uh, as I was coming here, he was, uh, he told me something that got me thinking. He said, uh, music, and you will understand why I'm giving this, uh, uh, this, the, the, this expression about music. Uh, he said, music is the connection between logic and emotion. To me, it sounded like superstition. And I think when we talk about superstition in an audience like this, uh, it does, it does um, uh, make an interesting conversation. And the reason why I'm talking about music is, is, is because uh, Professor Kadata this is actually a, a trained pianist. But he, he says uh, a Yamaha is probably the lowest he can be able to, to play here. <laughs> and you couldn't um, afford uh, what, what, what he had to, do, to say. But I think this issue of um, connection between emotion and music is a very interesting one. Because uh, a great deal of physicists, I've read quite a bit of, uh, of, 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 of biographies of physicists. I read uh, Genius, uh, which was on, on Feynman. Uh, I have read uh, uh, Einstein. And one common thread is this connection between music and physics. For Feynman, it was the bongo. He was a bongo player. Not quite to, 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 to the high level uh, that uh, Professor Stephen would, would, would obviously play. Piano is, is probably a much more sophisticated equipment, musical equipment, than a bongo. You know? And we all know that um, Einstein was uh, was, 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 was very good with uh, violin. So maybe what um, Professor Vilakas was talking about, the connection between logic, music, and perhaps physics, is not uh, as much a superstition as uh, I, I had imagined when he first uttered uh, those words. Uh, this evening, we're going to be listening to, to the inaugural lecture of Professor Karataglitis. And I hope uh, in his uh, inaugural lecture, he is going to, to give us the music. Maybe it is not going to be uh, vocally represented by sound, but certainly the music of physics uh, that uh, some of us who are not from the discipline are going to absolutely enjoy listening to. Uh, as an engineer, uh, which we can define as... Uh, almost a failed physicist. And I, was, I was reading uh, an autobiography of, of German. And German, uh, Mary German won a Nobel Prize in Physics. Uh, when he was in high school, he, he, his father asked him, what, what do you want to study? And he said he wanted to study physics. And his uh, father was quite uh, uh, an physicist, but uh, uh, aren't you going to starve? And he says, no, 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 I, I want to study physics. He says, why don't you study um, maybe business? And he says, no, no, no. He says, why don't you study uh, electrical engineering? Apparently, he said, I would rather start than study <laughs> electrical engineering. But, but, but the connection between engineering and science is absolutely instructive. Uh, you can't do engineering without uh, uh, science, physics. Uh, and, and that connection is very important to us at the University of Johannesburg. So we are excited that uh, 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 physics continues to thrive at the University of Johannesburg, not only for the benefit of, of physicists. One of my dreams is that uh, you know, sometimes in the future, uh, people in the humanities must actually be exposed to physics and other sciences. Um, uh, they have to understand how the universe was created. Uh, they have to understand about uh, the theory of, of, of the Big Bang. Uh, not to 
in, in, in a sophisticated matter, manner, but just uh, to really understand, you know, uh, nature as, as it was uh, conceived many, many years ago. In those few words, I, I would like to welcome you uh, to the University of Johannesburg. And uh, I welcome you to, 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 we are an open university that believes that, um, uh, you know, a measure of how clever you are is by how many questions you pose rather than you answer. So we would be expecting you to engage uh, with, with what is going to be said uh, so that uh, we can have a good intellectual discussion. Thank you very much. And uh, once again, congratulations, Professor, for this important milestone. Acting Vice Chancellor, honest, honored guests, ladies and gentlemen, good evening. Professor Karatlidis' uh, academic career reads as follows. Professor Karatlidis received his PhD in theoretical nuclear physics at the University of Melbourne, Australia under the supervision of Professor Ken Amos in 1995, with a thesis entitled, Large-Scale Shell Model Analysis of Complementary Nuclear Reactions, concentrating on the area of overlap between nuclear structure and reaction theory. In particular, developing what has become known as the Melbourne G folding model of nucleon-nucleus interactions. He also did his undergraduate and master's degrees at the University of Melbourne, the latter in experimental nuclear physics. During his PhD, he also completed an associate diploma in piano from the Australian Music Examinations Board and was co-host and physics reporter for a popular science radio show in Melbourne. After he completed his PhD, Professor Karataklidis went to the National Superconducting Cyclotron Laboratory at Michigan State University in the USA for his first postdoctoral fellowship. It was here that his interest in exotic nuclei began, and in particular, the many body descriptions of halo nuclei. Postdoctoral fellowships at Triumph, Canada, and the Los Alamos National Laboratory, USA, followed. After this, Stephen spent a year as a visiting staff member in the nuclear theory group at the CEA Bruyers Le Chateau, France. Following that year, Stephen moved back to Melbourne as a research fellow of the School of Physics, University of Melbourne, for two and a half years. In mid-2006, Professor Karataklidis joined the faculty at the Department of Physics and Electronics at Rhodes University as a senior lecturer. He was promoted to associate uh, lecturer in 2008 and became head of that department in 2009. In April 2010, he joined the faculty at the University of Johannesburg in the Department of Physics as professor. From 2006, Stephen has been the head of the theory division of the South African CERN program, which is dedicated to nuclear and particle physics research both experimental and theoretical at CERN, and is one of the program's founding members. He also served on the program advisory committee of Itemba Labs from 2007 to 2011, serving as chair of that committee from 2008. He has served and con continues to serve on many panels at the highest level at the National Research Foundation. With almost 80 research articles to his name, Professor Karata Klidis' work continues on the interplay between nuclear structure and nuclear reaction theory. With particular emphasis on the structures of exotic nuclei and how one may obtain information on such at the microscopic level from nuclear reactions. He enjoys collaborations, both experimental and theoretical, from the world over, particularly from the University of Melbourne, Australia, from Japan and Tohoku University. Most importantly, he is part of MCAS collaboration, which is representatives from Australia, Canada, and Italy. His longest collaboration continues to be with Professor Ken Amos, his former supervisor, with over 50 papers published together to this date. He has also had collaborations in France as well. Thank you very much. Thank you.
Acting Vice Chancellor, Professor Malala. Acting Dean of Science, Professor Matete. On our guests, Professor Vilakazi from Leeds. It is interesting that the Acting Vice Chancellor should mention Murray Gell-Mann, who I've met on a couple of occasions, because I have an interesting anecdote courtesy of his fellow graduate student, former Director of Triumph, Professor Eric Vogt. And it turns out that they both started off as students of Wigner in nuclear theory. Murray Gell-Mann, however, found nuclear physics far too difficult and chose something easier. The rest is history. Uh, quite often when people ask me what I do for a living, I have to wonder how to reply because I have a choice. I can either answer a physicist, in which case I get the response, oh, I failed physics in high school. Or I can answer theoretical physicist. I sometimes answer nuclear physicist, but that brings up all the background of the Cold War era, and then I have to be careful. So the question is, OK, I'm technically speaking a theoretical nuclear physicist. And I often wonder to myself, why do I do it? Well, why theoretical physics, first of all? Let's look to the philosophers and what has been said about theoretical physics. I can start with Bertrand Russell. It is only theory that makes men completely incautious. OK. Not necessarily a glowing recommendation. Brian Silver, facts may be regarded as indisputable. Theories are not. Edwin Hubble, no theory is sacred. Maybe Albert Einstein can help me out here. The th scientific theorist is not to be envied. This is not a recommendation for theoretical physics. Certainly, if one thinks of theoretical physics, one could hopefully bring up Galileo, the thoughts of Galileo, Newton, certainly Einstein, I would hope, maybe Stephen Hawking. No. I was at a conference in Santon last October with academics from all disciplines from around the country. The one person that came to mind when I said I was a theoretical physicist was this fellow. <laughs> the show has a lot to answer for. And Sheldon Cooper's name crops up all the time. The only redeeming feature, apart from the fact that it is, so, shall we say, a popular sitcom in the US, is the fact that they do get the physics right. That is a recommendation that I do have a particle theorist from UCLA as an advisor. Okay, so theoretical physics is not necessarily a good place to start. Let's try nuclear physics. Okay, I'll go back to my country, <coughs> Democritus. Nothing exists except atoms and empty space. Everything else is opinion. That's good. That means I'm on the right track. Ralph Waldo Emerson. The intellect sees that every atom carries the whole of nature. Another good recommendation for doing nuclear physics. <coughs> Maybe I can look to my cousin across the Tasman, Ernest Rutherford, who discovered the nucleus in the first place. He said, the atom is a nice hard fellow, red or grey in colour according to taste. This is a problem. Um, For when all is said and done, we can go to find good quotes about the topic. The true thing about nuclear physics and the study of nuclear physics is that it is still at the forefront of the still greatest unsolved problem in physics in general. And that is the so trying to solve the many-body problem, which encompasses atomic physics, condensed matter physics, planetary physics, gal galactic physics. Once you get to a system of bodies beyond two, things become complicated. The three-body problem, the two-body problem was solved by Newton. The three-body problem was solved only in 1960. 300-year gap. 
The four-body problem has not been solved. Anything above that is impossible to solve, as we understand it. So let's look at, nucle at the nuclei. It's a many-body system of protons and neutrons, and we want to understand what is happening at the centre of the atom. So we look to the periodic table. That is our laboratory. And to a chemist, that's what it looks like. We see that, we've seen that since high school. <coughs> All the way from hydrogen up to element 118. Element 117 has just been discovered in Germany. <coughs> and nicely arranged according to Mendeleev's scheme from the 1860s. This is what the periodic table looks to a nuclear physicist. 118 elements, some 4 to 10,000 nuclei to play with. The proton number running up gives you the element. The neutron number across gives you the isotope. And what is in black are the stable nuclei, the ones we know from studying the periodic table. Everything else, some of them can be formed in a laboratory. They're unstable to beta decay. Emissions of electrons to try and things, make things more stable. But still bound systems of protons and neutrons. So we can still study those as bound systems of protons and neutrons. They are short-lived in the laboratory, but long-lived enough to observe and study. They are essential in understanding how the elements of nature are created within the start stellar environment. And this is part of my work. So neutrons leading to neutron stars is the extreme example, is one of the uh, remnants of uh, stars after they die. But the problem of studying nuclei, which are incredibly small beasts, is something of a conundrum. We need to know ultimately, the structure of the nucleus. That's the aim of the game. Do we understand its structure? Well, to understand the nuclear structure, it's the study of the nucleus as arrangements of protons and neutrons. The experimental evidence for nuclei, dating back to Rutherford's first experiment, come from nuclear reactions. That's the only way we can observe and infer the existence of nuclei. We observe spectra, energy spectra, and other scattering or reaction data, depending on what we send into the nucleus to interact with it. And they give information about the structure. In effect, it's like playing a game of billiards at a very small scale. We send something in the cue ball. We break up the triangle of balls. They scatter. We see how they scatter. We can try and from the scattering information, rearrange the triangle that they were to begin with. That's the goal. The problem is we need to understand nuclear reactions to do it. How do we understand nuclear reactions? Well, the study of nuclear reactions, which includes scattering or decay of nuclei or transfer reactions, if something comes in and something else comes out, leaving behind a proton or a neutron or picking up a proton or a neutron, the problem of understanding nuclear reactions, it requires knowledge first of nuclear structure. And now we are in a bit of a bind. Because there, it's a catch-22. Where do you start? Because knowledge of one requires knowledge of the other, and we don't know where to begin. So we need to construct some models in order to start somewhere. And usually the point at which we start in terms of models is to model nuclear structure first. If we want to do things microscopically, as modelling a nucleus as a collection of neutrons and protons. Excuse me. <coughs> the most successful model of nuclear structure is the shell model. And this is a diagrammatic representation of the shell model. And this is where... I do the bulk of my calculations for light nuclei. It was independently uh, put forward as a model of nuclear structure by Maria Gappenmeyer of Argonne National Labs and Hans Jensen in Europe. 
1948. And they shared with Eugene Bigner the 1963 Nobel Prize. It wasn't an equal share. Bigner got half the prize and the other, and, uh, the other two shared the other half. So it's been recognised, it was recognised by the Nobel Committee as something important. But it is still a model. To this day, we don't know why this works. But it does. What about nuclear reactions? If we start off with this, nuclear reactions, well, we need a description of the nucleus. We can obtain it from the uh, shell model, for example. There are other models of nuclear structure available, which I've worked with as well. And once we have a description of the nucleus from some model, we then say, OK, for the Melbourne G-folding model, as was mentioned, how does it interact, say, with a proton or a neutron? We may send in an electron or a photon or even another nucleus if we did. The first nuclear reaction was an alpha particle scattering off gold, off a gold nucleus. That's how the nucleus was discovered. Well, conceptually speaking, what we do is simple to understand. The problem involves solving integral differential equations or coupled integral equations or all manner of uh, coupled systems of equations that require a lot of mathematical development and computation, which I won't go into. So we fold in. That's the expression for doing all of this high-level mathematics and computing. Elements of the nuclear structure. We sum over all possible protons and neutrons in the nucleus interacting with that incident particle, what their contributions will be. Once we, have, once we get that, we can then form the appropriate measured quantity. Cross-section, spin-observable, spectra, that's the sort of handful that we have. And we can then compare to data. And if we're lucky and we understand what is going on, that comparison can be good. And the first paper that was done on this was published back in 1995. It was from my PhD thesis. It appeared just before I received it. And it was on proton, carbon-12, elastic and inelastic scattering. Protons in the title, but we also did for everything that we did on the proton side, looking at how protons interacted with carbon-12, we also looked at the equivalent electron, elastic, and inelastic scattering. Because we wanted to compare the two. With electrons, you know pretty much what is going on. It interacts through the electromagnetic field with the nucleus. We understand the electromagnetic field. It's Maxwell's equations. So in order to do that comparison, we should be fine. So we start off with a shell model. Here's the spectrum of carbon-12 that I calculated during my PhD. To get that diagram during my PhD, it took me about a month's worth of computing time. That was 20 years ago. To do the equivalent time, equivalent calculation on my laptop will take about five seconds these days. Tells you how far we've come in computation. But for almost every state, there is a correspondence with the particular models that I constructed, except for the last one, which could only calculate a certain fraction of the states. There is one big exception to that, and that is that second 7.65 MeV state, known as the Hoyle state. No shell model can get that. So if we take that out of the equation, everything else we find correspondence. And if we now look at elastic scattering, well, there's electron scattering. Looks good in comparison to the available data at the time. And if we look at the equivalent 200 MeV proton scattering, <coughs> We did two sets of calculations, one assuming that the interaction was free of the density of the nucleus. The other had the density dependence in there. And you can see that the density dependence works much better in considering the data as a whole. That tells one exactly the nuclear response and how it, is mod how it modifies the interaction. The important key about all of these calculations, no parameters involved in calculations. Because nuclear physics generally is so difficult with regards to the models that one constructs, there are always some parameters that one usually needs to fit to the data that one is describing. 
It is much better <coughs> if we had a possibility for models where that was not done. Then you can extract meaningful information. And this is where our starting point was. We can look to inelastic scattering for several of the states that are exciting the nucleus. For the differential cross-section, several states obtained. And you'll see that not all of the descriptions, uh, not all of the predictions that I made, or the, cal or the calculations that I made, the results I obtained, agreed with the data. The same applies to the analyzing power. And you would think that there's something wrong with the model. Well, for each of these states, we also calculated the electron inelastic scattering. And we found that the discrepancies that we observe here were also the discrepancies that we observed in the analysis of the electron scattering data. In that respect, there's only one problem that enters into the situation, and that is our input nuclear structure. It is the structure model itself that has a problem. And in that case, we now have a situation where we have a theory, a model, which can be used to extract meaningful information about nuclear structure for both, for both protons and electrons, or neutrons, as we subsequently found, incident on uh, nuclei. And that is ultimately the game. If there is a problem with our model of nuclear structure, we want to know about it. That is the way the field progresses. And this was able to do it. If we go along with the similar sort of thing, we look at another nucleus. Another example that springs to mind is to look at the skin thickness in lead 208. Lead 208 is a doubly closed shell nucleus. It is a tightly bound nucleus. It is one of the most studied nuclei in the periodic table. One, because it's so prevalent on Earth, you can pretty much dig it up anywhere, but also because it is a doubly closed shell nucleus, it is a tightly bound nuclear. It is basically from the radioactive decay of the elements above it, this is what you end up with. And we want to see how far the neutron density extends beyond the proton density. That is the definition of the skin thickness. How much of, do the neutrons envelop the protons that they surround? Well, we published this in 2002, submitted 2001. And it is one of, I think, my second most cited paper these days. But we obtained a prediction of 0.17 Fermi. We used electron scattering analyses and proton and neutron scattering analyses of the available data to come up with a prediction of that number. And we get 0.17 Fermi from the available models of structure that were around from lead to a late. What is notable about this paper, and it was commented on by a colleague of mine from Los Alamos. I wrote this while I was there. He looked at this paper and he said, there's not one single equation in this paper. How did you get away with that? But we did. For a theory paper, that is not easy to do. And this is the only time that did it. The measured value at the time, all the measurements, went anywhere between 0 0.6 femtometers and 0.33 femtometers. A femtometer is 10 to the minus 15 meters. Just so you, it gives you an idea of how small these things are. And those are largely from electron scattering experiments being done at the Jefferson Laboratory in the US. With error bars, they pretty much can even encompass the value of zero. Very difficult experiments to do. When I published this paper, I spoke to one of the Jefferson uh, experimental scientists, a friend of mine. And when I showed him this paper, he said, good, we don't have to do the experiment. I said, well, yeah, you do. It would still be nice to have a number to, to test against what we think it is. Now, as I was preparing for this talk and for this evening, I got everything because of last week with the SIOP conference. This prepared much earlier. But two weeks ago, a paper appeared in Physical Review Letters. Neutron skin of lead 208 from coherent pion photoproduction, an experiment of gamma pi zero done at the Mainz Microtron by the groups in Glasgow and Edinburgh with some other people from various places. The Crystal Ball collaboration and the A2 collaboration. They obtained a much more precise value of that skin thickness, 0 0.15 plus or minus 0 0.03 Fermi. And in the paper, they made a claim that no nuclear theory model could predict this result because they 
had referenced every nuclear theory paper calculating this except one. So I wrote to my colleagues, two of them, John Anand from Glasgow and uh, Bill <coughs> Briscoe from George Washington University, and I sent them the paper, and bearing in mind this was two weeks ago, and if you look back at the prediction that I made in 2001, we're not doing too badly. And John Anand had some colourful language when he saw this paper <laughs> that I sent him, along with an apology. Because it would have changed the tenant of their paper had they done a little more homework. So that's something on the stable nuclei, things that I've done over the years. But my current research concentrates more on exotic nuclei. So if we look at the stable nuclei again, black, the known nuclei are in the pink there, and we study those for their own sake. They, they um, give some very important uh, information on various phenomena that appear, but they're also important for nuclear astrophysics. And the halo nucleus, they can either be halo or skins, I just spoke about skins, but halo nuclei, lithium-11. When you measure the radius of lithium-11, you find that it's as large as lead-208. And that was known since 1985. And it's known as a Borromean nucleus because if you remove any one of those components, either the two neutrons or the lithium-9 core, the whole thing falls apart. And the Borromean name comes from the Borromeo rings where you, the three interlocking rings of the Borromeo house, Borromeo house in Italy, you remove one ring, you can't put the other two together. But it's a misnomer of this picture is a misnomer. It is not as simple as that. Because if you look at the shell model description of lithium-11, you find this as the wave function. This is the function that describes lithium-11. And it is that bit. If we look to the simple picture of lithium-11, describes the extensivity, the halo aspect. In other words, 37% of the time, it looks like this. The other 62% or 63% of the time, those two neutrons are sitting inside the lithium-9 core as a tightly bound object. There are certain experiments which can only see this halo nature. Other experiments can see the whole thing. And what I did with my colleagues, we looked at the experiments that could see the whole thing, and we needed this decomposition. And certainly that was the case for scattering cross-sections from hydrogen. And we find that certainly we need that description where we can extend the neutron density further out, but we still need that compactness for most of the time to get what is happening at low angles. There's a special case, helium-6. Up until the, the publication of this paper, half the papers were saying halo, half the papers were saying skin. It's more tightly bound than lithium-11, but not so tightly bound to be guaranteeing a skin. And what we did, we say, OK, we can treat it either as a halo or not and see what happens. Elastic scattering, kind of halo, a couple of data points suggested. Inelastic scattering, to the 2 plus state, yes it does. The reaction cross-section was the clincher. All self-consistent descriptions. Predicted value, or values, 353 microbars, the units involved. For the non-halo case, 406 micro, uh, millibar, sorry, not microbar, for the halo. The measured value which my experimental colleagues gave me after I did this calculation was 409 plus or minus 22 millibar. An incredibly accurate result that clinched it as a halo nucleus. And the thing is, the density is the key. There's no such thing as distinction between halos and skins. It is simply density and how bound the nucleus is, binding energy. If it's very loosely bound, the density extends. If it's not so loosely bound, the density doesn't extend so much. And that gives you a self-consistent picture of the two. And we showed that in the following paper from... 2000. More recently, last year, experiments at RECAN were looking to do spin observables. 
This is helium-6 proton scattering. Top is cross-section, bottom is analyzing power. The left is for helium-8. The error bars on the analyzing power data, these are extremely difficult experiments to do. It requires more data to, and, and better experimental procedures to try and get better data. But for now, we're not doing so badly, as far as that is concerned. So we're still working with the Japanese experimenters, uh, for which Professor Suda is a member, to, to work with them and analyze the data. On the other side of the coin now, this is all intermediate energy scattering, nuclear structure studies. But a lot of facilities these days are looking at much lower energies with nuclear astrophysics as a goal. So we're developing what is called MCAS, multi-channel algebraic scattering theory, <coughs> low energy scattering. It's low energy scattering with descriptions of compound nuclear states. A proton and neutron comes in, forms a new nucleus and then scatters. And we want to find out the structure of the new nucleus. We treat the Pauli principle of nucleon comes in, it can only go to it can only interact with what's there in certain ways. And the bound and continuum nuclear states scattering or not self-consistently. And one of the first papers was this published in 2005 in Physical Review Letters. And when we do neutron scattering of carbon 12, we end up with states in carbon 13 and we do very well over a 10 MeV range, and also get the cross-section. So that gives you a flavor of the type of research that we're still doing, because we're still, a lot of people are still studying exotic nuclei. This is a small pricey with regards to uh, MCAS. There is a lot of more work being done, a lot more developmental work being done. The program is not finished. And the, ex and the research program itself is, is ongoing and quite involves heavy computation and mathematical development. Which is, on, which is continuing now. So a lot of work still to be done there. And, uh, very interesting work, especially the applications to astrophysics. So to, con to conclude at this point, or almost conclude at this point, these are some of my collaborators over the years. Ken Amos, Peter Dorbins, Cornelius Benthold, you can read the list. I will highlight certain people as important. Ken Amos. He was my thesis advisor for my PhD. We have been close collaborators for the last 25 years, and that collaboration is still very strong, and we still work well together. Cornelius Benthold, I will mention, late of George Washington University. He was a high-energy nuclear theorist doing a lot of work at Jefferson Lab Physics, but he had an appreciation for the low energy, for what nuclear structure could bring to that table. Because a lot of work being done in a lot of nuclear laboratories, forget the goal. We want to understand the nucleus. I worked well with him. He unfortunately, sadly, passed away a few years ago. Bertrand Giraud and Nicolas Alamanos of Saclay still work closely with both of those. And of course, my colleague Toshimi Suda, who is standing right here. So to conclude, Still a lot of work to be done, but I'm reminded of those words of Einstein. The scientific theorist is not to be envied. It's not easy work. So why do it? Because Einstein himself said it best as a rebuttal. A theory is the more impressive, the greater its simplicity of its premises, the more different kinds of thinking it relates and the more extended its area of applicability. And since my PhD days, this has been my guiding principle. Thank you. As Chancellor, I'm reading to you the response from Professor Ken Amos. I regret very much not being able to present at the inaugural address by my longtime friend and colleague, Stephen Karadiglidis. However, I am delighted to be a respondent to what I am sure would have been an excellent address. Usually, a respondent is considered to be a person against whom a petition is brought, especially in a divorce suit or appeal. Fortunately, there is also the interpretation that a respondent is an assenter, namely one who concurs with a proposal or report and makes comment on that. 
I have known Stephen for many years. Initially as a postgraduate student here in the University of Melbourne. At first, I had reason to think that he was in need of a quiet word in his ear over his decision to pursue studies in nuclear experimentation centered about a rather decrepit aged Betatron facility. But he did achieve results with it and his very first paper was entitled The Seven Lithium Gamma Neutron Six Lithium Cross Section Near Threshold. It appeared in Nuclear Physics in 1989 and I believe this was a result of your master's degree work, Stephen. However, Stephen quite quickly saw the light on the hill and switched to become a student of nuclear physics theory. For his sins, he wound up with me as his PhD supervisor. Fortunately, he was really quite good at it, and so all I had to do was red pen drafts of papers he produced. Of course, the first check, which is <coughs> the Herr Dr. Professor rule, was to see that my name was on it. Usually there were four or five drafts, as I recall, before winding up with a final version, which always seemed to have an uncanny resemblance to what he first gave me. However, <coughs> those times of trials and tribulation did not end with either antipathy or frustration, and Stephen has been and remains so to this day a valued collaborator in joint research efforts. His career has taken him around the world, starting with postdoctoral positions in the USA and Canada, before returning briefly to Melbourne as a visiting staff member. He then took a position at the French Atomic Energy Commission, known as the CEA, Rueil Le Chatel in France. Following that stint, he made South Africa his home, taking up a post in Rhodes University, before his move to the professorship, for which this is his inaugural speech. Those travels and diverse experiences gave Stephen the breadth of research topics in which he has expertise. While his research studies basically can be classified as ones of nuclear structure and nuclear reactions, they include topics as diverse as, firstly, finding solutions of the coupled channel lippmann schwinger equations for nuclear nuclear systems, so obtaining a self-consistent specification of the bound and resonant states in the compound system. Secondly, through studies of density functional theory to investigate the validity of inherent assumptions and to construct algebraic density functionals. Thirdly, to investigating of the S factor of the seven beryllium proton gamma reaction near the gamma of energy and developing models for the structure of important R and RP process nuclei near the drip lines. Stephen has that elusive quality of being able to explain the complex nature of his research in terms understandable to intelligent people unfamiliar with his field of study. I am sure that all at this presentation will have seen that demonstrated quite clearly. Given the diversity of topics in which he has studied and published, the continuation of research output over many years, and the number of colleagues throughout the world with whom he has worked, and whom wish to maintain his collaboration. It is most evident that he has an international standing of the highest repute. Thank you. Um, good evening, ladies and gentlemen. Um, I am very glad and honored uh, to attend this inauguration of my dearest friends and long-term collaborators, collaborator, Professor Karata Grace. I am Toshimi Suda uh, from Tokyo University, Sendai, Japan. Uh, we are currently working in the same field of nuclear physics as uh, Stephen has been told, and more specifically on um, the study of the structure and reaction of exotic radioactive nuclei. Uh, Stephen is a theorist, and I am an experimentist. Exotic nuclei do not exist in nature stably. However, it is now today widely recognized the understanding of them, this them is a key law to understand of um, where and how all elements have been synthesized in the universe after the Big Bang. Uh, solving this problem 
uh, is classified as one of the 11 unanswered great questions in physics of this century. Um, this is a very big challenge for uh, nuclear physicists uh, worldwide. Experimentally, uh, the production and manipulations of those exotic nuclei are very difficult. And we need a very sophisticated and consistent theoretical framework, which is a most difficult task for theorists, as already Stephen explained to you. So um, this is because they are many body systems and they are interacting through very complicated strong interactions. So I'm very happy to collaborate with uh, Professor Stephen uh, Karatagridis in such an ex uh, exciting research field. Uh, today, let me introduce you our long-term collaborations briefly. We have, met, we have first met uh, in the very late 80s in Japan as being uh, graduate students. Stephen was a member of the um, experimental group of University of Melbourne and stayed at our Tokyo University in Sendai to perform their photonuclear reaction experiment. In the 80s, Tokyo University started to provide so-called tagged photon beam for photonuclear experiments, which were available only at several laboratories in the, in the world. The Melbourne group was one of the power users in our laboratories, and Stephen uh, stayed with us for a couple of months. And both of, both of us work, uh, worked together quite hard as work horses, which result the experiment are very successful. After the same experiment, however, I learned that Stephen switched to the theory group, headed by uh, Professor Amos. So we have somewhat drifted apart as a theorist and an experimentist. The situation changed in 2004. I have already moved from Tokyo University Sendai to Riken, near Tokyo, uh, to get into a new research field where the world's most advanced heavy ion cyclotron facility to be constructed. The facility is now today called Riken Radioactive Isotope Beam fa Factory. Uh, since its operation in uh, 2007, the facility has been the world leading research center for uh, the structure and the reaction of exotic radioactive nucleus. One day, I was reading a paper, and I found that the first author was Karatagridis, named Karatagridis. I asked myself whether this guy is a Stephen whom I know. Of course, I know that Karatagridis is not so common in the world, but I uh, immediately sent an email to him. Um, Hello, my name is Toshimi Suda, and I am very interested in your paper. By the way, may I ask you whether you are Stephen, with whom I worked Sendai in the late uh, 80s? Immediately, a reply prompted up on my terminal. Hi, Toshimi, do you think there are many Karatagoridis in the world uh, who are nuclear physicists? It's me. It was a happy surprise to me and uh, realized that both of us were again in the same field. So I switched the research field and also he switched the field. And I found that his sophisticated and very consistent theoretical framework we have heard is um, very necessary for us to extract our experimental data, reliable and precise information about the internal structure of exotic radioactive nuclei. So his theoretical framework has been widely known today, uh, no, not today, widely known as a G, uh, Melbourne G matrix, uh, G matrix with high reputations. So I immediately organized a workshop and invited Stephen to Japan. I also invited many theorists and experimenters from all over the Japan uh, to sit down together with Stephen for intensive discussions. And it was uh, fortunately a great success in this way, our close collaboration restarted again. All right. Since then, our collaboration has been going very smoothly and fruitful, as you see that I am here today. I hope our collaboration hands in hand in difficult but very exciting research field will provide fruitful results in nuclear physics. 
and also stimulate young researchers of, of both countries. <coughs> Finally, uh, please call, forgive me to take one more minute of your time to speak about a lot of personal things. In um, 2011, we had a terrible earthquake um, on March 11th in Japan. It was the largest earthquake I, I have ever experienced in my life, for more than 50 years. I was, um, it, uh, I was in Riken near Tokyo for experiment, which was about 350 kilometers away from my hometown, Sendai, where my family was there. Um, I was so shocked to know that the epicenter was close to my hometown, Sendai, since the quake was so hard, even in Tokyo, apart from 300 feet, more than 300 kilometers away. So I immediately uh, started driving towards Sendai to rescue my family. It was a terrible time because uh, no phone connection was available and I had no way to know if they are safe. Um, while dri driving to Sendai, I realized that the Twitter on the internet was alive. So I continuously tweeted in the hopes that my family would check my Twitter accounts and know that um, they knew that I am heading home. Later I learned that all this effort was in vain because all including the internet of Sendai was completely off. So <clears throat> actually they could not check my Twitter accounts and they did not, they have waited me for more, over the, um, more than 20 hours. After 20 hours drive, I arrived at home and find my family waiting me in the dark and uh, freezing house. When electricity was recovered, about a week, I found many emails from the world that asking our safe. Among them, I found an email from Stephen in Johannesburg. He said, Hi Toshimi, we are thinking of you at this terrible moment. We have been following your Twitter using web translators and know that you and your family were safe. My wife and I were so moved to tears uh, by his emails. <coughs> Excuse me, tears coming. All right, uh, this message gave us feeling that we are not alone in the world and gave us courage to stand up and set our life again. Uh, let me take this opportunity to express uh, sincere thanks of my family to Steve and Lara. Thank you very much. Thank you very much, uh, ladies uh, and gentlemen. And I think uh, you will agree with me that uh, this was a very insightful uh, uh, presentation that was given by all the speakers uh, who have spoken um, today. I would like to invite uh, Professor Karutaitlitis to come forward and also the acting dean to come forward so that we can, he, she can assist me to rope the professor. <coughs> Uh, it is indeed a great pleasure for me to formally congratulate you uh, for this milestone. Uh, he has been a professor for quite a while. This is just uh, a formality, you know. But it is uh, 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 quite important. And congratulations. Thank you. Uh, may we all stand uh, for the procession to, to, to start and after that uh, we will meet on the other side where we are going to have uh, refreshments and cocktails. Thank you very much.